Competitive Pokemon movesets make no sense. Take a Pokemon like Landorus Therian, for example, 145 base attack, and this dude decides to run max special defense. So again, competitive Pokemon movesets make no sense at first glance. Many Pokemon are not purely offensive or purely defensive, though we usually consider them to be in one or the other category. They're really somewhere in between, with potential to play on both sides. Sure, there are exceptions, like Deoxys Attack and Blissey, but those are just that, exceptions. Many Pokemon that are considered defensive staples automatically assume to be bulky sets when you see them in Team Preview or when they hit the field are actually quite good as offensive Pokemon. Just look at Rotom Wash in Generations 5 and onward. The opposite is also true. Many Pokemon considered offensive are also quite good defensively, such as Superior. The question that this video aims to answer is as follows. In a game that's all about damage, why would someone take such incredible offensive Pokemon and use them defensively? Well, but much of what makes these offensive pokes good is their typing, stats, and ability letting them switch into opposing Pokemon to hit the field consistently. This attribute of course lends itself well to defensive sets. And unless you're running the most extreme hyper offensive teams imaginable, you need some form of defense to fall back on. Because when you're staring down that giant threat, that choice band Kartana, that life orb Landorus incarnate, and your own offense is inevitably countered, you will need to switch into opposing attacks, at least temporarily. That's how the game of Pokemon works. Unless you're the type of player that just doesn't switch, and I might have to make another video for you. <laughs> but going back to my point, even these hyper offensive teams have some form of defense in the type synergy between their members. I mean, being able to withstand opposing hits is what gives setup sweepers the opportunity to set up. So before we go forward, I just wanna say if you are new to the channel, make sure you leave a like if you do enjoy this type of content, and also subscribe. I'm on my way to 300K and you can help me get there. If everybody who watched this video subscribed today, I could hit 300K right now. Here are a few examples to illustrate the overlapping spectrum of offense and defense. Half the reason DPP Breloom is such a threat isn't just because of how offensively potent it is. It's because it's so good at switching in against so many opposing Pokemon over and over. This also means that it wields a defensive set quite well. It all depends on the type of team one is using and the context of the metagame. Let's take the example of Groudon, primal or not. It's an amazing defensive Pokemon. It's also one of the best offensive Pokemon in the game, or not, because Sword and Shield. Whether or not offensive or defensive Groudon is preferred depends on the team it's used on, and how well that team, or that style of team, matches up against the metagame as a whole. It's also crucial to remember that defensive does not mean offensively useless. This is a common misconception, that just because Skarmory is a defensive Pokemon meant to counter others means it's not able to retaliate effectively. However, as anyone who's played serious competitive Pokemon can tell you, well-wielded residual damage tactics like spikes and stealth rock can be just as devastating as any offensive attack. It would, for example, be a serious mistake to think Ferrothorn couldn't mess you up itself just because it's a wall. Furthermore, many defensive Pokemon still hit many opposing Pokemon quite hard. Sure, there are some Pokemon like Bronzong who aren't threatening in and of themselves, but part of what constitutes many effective defensive Pokemon is the ability to hit back. Not every defensive Pokemon has Groudon level offenses, of course, but something like Lander's Theory and certainly comes close. Of course, there is a limit to the concept of offensively threatening Pokemon running defensive sets. Nobody's running bulky Deoxys attack, and if you are, Caterpie has higher defense in serious matches. However, there is a reason so many offensive Pokemon are so good at running defensive sets, and proving that concept is not a waste. The traits that comprise good defense often overlap with those that allow them to execute their offense. It is just offense of a different breed. We've selected a list of several offensive Pokemon, divided into similarly functioning subsets that are among the best, most popular defensive Pokemon in the game as well. Our first example is the most famous and the most fitting. The bulky ground type is one of Pokemon's most classic defensive archetypes, and two of the most famous bulky grounds are among the most threatening Pokemon in the game. Bulky Lanner's T is such a staple that people actually get surprised when its offensive sets show up. Yeah, that Pokemon would stab Earthquake and attack stat almost at Groudon's level, Swords Dance and Rock Polish. Offensive Garchomp is not so polarized, but the classic Tank Chomp set has been surprisingly prominent even surpassing the offensive variants at several times across several metagames, for one of the most uniquely threatening offensive threats around with that incredible speed stat and stab combination. 
These two are used in part because their more naturally offensive leanings offer unique advantages over their comparatively weaker bulky ground competition in Gliscor and Apaladon. That naturally higher attack stat goes a long way in immediate offensive threat even without investment. And both Lando T and Garchomp have the moveset freedom to even run Swords Dance on their defensive sets if they so desire, allowing them to really play both sides. It's especially nice to exploit opponents like Clefable that think they can abuse and assume passivity on the bulky ground side. Lando T and Garchomp also are uniquely blessed with defensive traits. Landers, of course, has the eternally amazing Intimidate, while Garchomp's rough skin, resistance to fire, and even neutrality to water are often put to great use as well. Landers and Garchomp's defensive traits are so many and so valuable that they disprove the concept of offensive Pokemon being wasted in such roles almost by themselves. So many times you'll be making a team and you will need the attributes they provide if you don't want to get over by half the metagame. They cover so much and not too many other Pokemon can do what they do. Of course, they are amazing offensive threats as well, but their teams must make sure that they are covering the threats these two check with something else. And there just aren't that many Pokemon that do so. In fact, one of the best ways to do so is to run a bulky variant of one of the two and the offensive variant of the other. We also have to give honorary mention to Groudon who was featured heavily in our intro because it epitomizes the concept of this video perfectly and has been doing so ever since its introduction in ADV. It has especially emphasized the idea of defensive Pokemon still being difficult to switch into. For example, Gen 4's special defensive Lava Plume Toxic Protect Groudon is one of the most difficult Pokemon to safely switch into in the entire tier, without a single EV investment in its offenses, and its bulk investment allows it to switch in on as many Pokemon as possible. Lander's Therian and Garchomp function similarly. And that's part of why the bulky ground has historically been good. It covers so much and it effortlessly deals out so much damage in return. Even something like the traditional defensive Swampert is good in large part for this reason. Its great defenses wouldn't be worth nearly as much if it wasn't so naturally effective at hitting back. Who would think such monstrous, extreme, all for nothing, go for broke threats like Volcarona and Mega Charizard X would ever run defensive sets? Not only were they among the scariest Pokemon in the game, but they alongside Talonflame also had defensive typings riddled with weaknesses that surely meant they would not be well equipped for a bulky role. But those typings also brought with them unique defensive boons. Boons which could be well utilized with their solid natural bulk, speed, and move pulls, most notably including the instant recovery of Roost. As such, though Zardex and Volk were still most prominently offensive threats, they also proved themselves immensely valuable in defensive roles. And I'm actually pretty proud because I, I created uh, Tank Zard X with my buddy Hugo. So I think that's pretty cool to be part of this history. While Talonflame went all the way and made its defensive roles its standard, Zard X and Talonflame's will o invalidates physical attackers, most notably the Lander's Therian that would otherwise be a comfortable switch into them, as well as other would-be answers like Tyranitar and Empowdon. Zard X and Talonflame are particularly valuable for stifling a terrifying opposing fire type, Mega Charizard Y. Zard X also becomes an excellent answer to electric types like Thunderous after Mega Evolving, while Talonflame is one of the best answers to Volcarona in the game. Speaking of Volcarona, it does not so much use the defensive set's bulk to act as a counter to opposing Pokemon so much as it uses it to increase its opportunities to set up and sweep. Part of what holds offensive Volcarona back is the limited chances it gets due to its frailty and lack of longevity, but defensive Volcarona is not so hindered, since it can now effortlessly shrug off earthquakes that would otherwise smash it. That said, like the other two fires, it's an excellent counter to Superior in Generation 6, even packing Bug Buzz to uniquely blast past Superior subs. Talonflame's excellent mono flying attack and coverage also allows it to turn its defensive utility into boosting opportunities for Swords Dance or Bulk Up. That is, if it doesn't prefer to run Taunt and become even more of a defensive, offensive Swiss Army Knife type of weapon. The anti-stealth rock support necessary for these Pokemon is intense, but the rewards are well worth it. We can also give an honorary mention to Volcanion, whose lack of recovery means it's not a true wall, however with bulk investment, its typing, bolstered by Water Absorb and just as unique as the other bulky fires in OU, can be utilized to great defensive effects, staving off offensive water type like no other fire type can. Heatran is one of the most consistent, dangerous offensive threats of all time, and it's also been one of the best defensive Pokemon ever. Its reach has even extended into Ubers in multiple generations. Heatran is Lander Assassin that is such an amazing, defining defensive Pokemon that one often forgets how monstrous it is offensively, and can even be surprised by its presence in a battle. Of course, with a defensive profile like the one Heatran's got, a ridiculously lengthy list of resistances and immunities to go alongside tremendous bulk and outstanding utility move pull, it's tough not to turn to Heatran to fix defensive holes in teams that otherwise be quite a tough cover. Special Defensive Heatran has been struggling off Hydro Pumps and Focus Blasts since it was first 
first introduced. It even takes most Earth powers, let alone the hidden power ground coverage it forces monsters like Volcarona to compromise its movesets with. And most of the attacks it takes aren't anywhere near as strong as these examples. Neutral attacks like Stab Thunderbolt are laughable, and if Heatran resists your attack, forget it. It regularly devours some of the strongest moves around, like Psychic Terrain boosted Psychics, Draco Meteors, and Outrageous too, because its natural physical bulk is quite solid as well. That's to say nothing of its complete immunity to fire, no matter how boosted it is in the sun or whatever. Heatran is of course a renowned destroyer of defensive Pokemon itself, having been one of the most prominent stall breakers since its introduction as well. Its offensive move pool is just as excellent as its utility one. However, as far as defensive Pokemon go, Heatran has been an entirely singular presence. Now this one might seem silly. Magirna has been considered by many to be one of the most broken Pokemon in Generation 7, possibly even the most broken. How could one possibly justify using a defensive set on this Pokemon? Well, it makes sense when you realize that Magirna is heatran esque in its ability to counter seemingly everything. Plus, Magirna is one of the best counters to a Pokemon that otherwise nearly impossible to answer safely, itself. Nani? Yes, using Magirna to counter Magirna because everything else gets destroyed may be your microcosm of the Gen 7 metagame as a whole. It is partially for this reason, but also for this next one, that perfectly demonstrates why you would want to use a defensive set on such an offensively bonkers Pokemon. Magirna's absolutely insane typing of bulk lets it withstand some of the otherwise most dangerous threats around. It lets you actually switch into utterly monstrous threats without much worry, whereas otherwise you'd be picking what to sacrifice every single time. Magirna's Assault Vest set staves off unevolved Specs Ash Greninja repeatedly, and its leftover set with Heart Swap allow it to counter some of the most insane psychic types in the game, Mega Alakazam, Tapu Lele, Reuniclus, and Mega Latias. Either variant withstands the monstrous superior and even more monstrous Kirin Black. What else actually withstands Kirin Black of all Pokemon? Magirna's defensive profile is absolutely insane. Just as its offensive sets threatened to break Gen 7 OU apart, its defensive sets held the tier together. Former Uber and generally dangerous offensive threat Excadrill, when unable to abuse Sand Rush in a never ending sand as it can now only do in Gen 5 Ubers, becomes a beacon of defensive utility thanks to Rapid Spin. Defensive typing that's loaded with resistances and a bevy of other support traits such as Stealth Rock, even potentially supported by Mold Breaker so it can't be blocked by Magic Bounce, and, crucially, the ability to hit several key metagame opponents super effectively in return, especially in conjunction with its solid speed stat. Though not as iconic as Stab Move as Earthquake, Extra Drill regularly uses Iron Head to crucial effect. In Gen 6, its main target is of course the Fairy type Clefable, but it also intensely critical in Gen 5 to smack the otherwise devastating Mamoswine. Extra Drill can pivot into all sorts of powerful attacks, for example, Mega DNC Stabs, all all sorts of electric moves and with investment usually live one super effective hit, which can turn the tide of a game depending on the million ways Extra Drill wants to support its team, rapid spinning, stealth rocking, or removing an opposing threat. Tyranitar is a monstrous offensive threat with poor speed, so what prevents it from going the way of Rampardo? Simple, it's also incredible defensively. With unique typing and superb bulk, especially when it gains the Sandstorm special defense boost in Generation 4, it already tanks hits well enough without investment. For example, in DPP, it is never O-code by a Life Orb Starmie Hydro Pump, so it follows that sets focusing on bulk achieves some truly incredible feats. Special defensive Tyranitar not only walls something as strong as Choice Specs Heatran and devours Draco Meters with ease, but it regularly survives quadruple effective Focus Blast from Pokemon as strong as Life Orb Gengar, whether it's Stealth Rocking, Pursuiting, both, or simply stifling an opponent's offenses, Tyranitar has been one of the most consistent defensive choices since its inception in Generation 2. Even when it mega evolves in Generation 6 and 7, it often used not just to increase its offensive threat level, but its hit taking capabilities as well. Tyranitar's defensive utility is so good that it often outweighs what a terrifying threat it is. Tyranitar has been ripping the game up since Generation 3, but it's often hard to slot on a team because its lack of leftovers or, starting in Gen 4, a resist berry and focus on offensive EV investment can leave its team wanting it in the defensive utility they've come to expect Tyranitar to provide. Offensive Tyranitar is still common and a great Pokemon, of course, but sometimes its defensive use is so crucial that its offensive aspect is overshadowed entirely. For the best example, look no further than Generation 5, where Tyranitar once regularly ran the likes of Choice Man, Extra Belt, and even Dark Gem without necessarily needing to maximize its bulk. But as the metagame progressed, it quickly became clear that any non-special defensive or Scarf Tyranitar, but usually special defensive, was objectively worse, because Tyranitar's defensive traits were just that valuable. Nothing did what it did. 
In addition to near Blissey levels of special walling, its sand stream changed the course of battles in ways Blissey and a Violite Chansey could only dream of. Plus, even before it had sand stream in the ability less second generation, Tyranitar was also a part in the pun rock. I'm not saying that. A rock solid defensive Pokemon? Did we write this? Get this out of here. Regularly going toe to toe with the best Pokemon in GSC, Snorlax, as well as other top tier staples like Executor. Tyranitar's presence as a defensive staple is almost as long as competitive Pokemon itself. Mega Scizor is a rare example of a Mega Pokemon whose bulky sets are often easier to slot onto a team than their offensive variants. And it's not hard to see why. With a defensive profile like the one it's rocking, Steel type, but with the fighting and ground neutrality thanks to being partially bugged, physical bulk better than that of Skarmory and a great special defensive stat, considering that special defensive Scizor was also quite tanky with a much lower one, Mega Scizor is a hit taking machine against some of the most hard to counter Pokemon in the game, most notably Gen 7 Kartana and while it also allowed in the tier, Zygarde, but also other terrors like Gen 6 Weavile and Bisharp and Mega Alakazam in both generations. It isn't just a passive wall either. Its most notably uses its signature stab U-turn to maintain momentum for its team, and had a bevy of options beyond that. Anti-hazard support with defog, item removal with knockoff, pursuit trapping, or even going for the late game finish with Swords Dance or occasionally in Gen 7, Curse, adding it to a pantheon of walls that can also sweep on a dime. Mega Scizor is a pillar of defensive teams that shapes how offensive teams must plan their offense. Yeah, Ferrothorn's annoying, but at least it's neutral to ice. Kieran Black would run HP Fire a lot less if it wasn't for Mega Scizor eternally walling it otherwise. It is one of the very few Pokemon that can stop ICMZ Kieran Black from forcing a KO. Of course, offensive Mega Scizor is a force to be reckoned with, but defensive Mega Scizor is one of the best walls you could ask for. Hydreigon is a quintessential offensive Pokemon, a mixed or choice specs dragon among the most fearsome the game has to offer. Yes, it has good defensive traits such as resistance, latent typing, bolstered by levitate, and solid natural bulk, but those are mainly used to help it fire off its offensive meteor showers. Throughout generations 5 and 6, Hydreigon was an all-out attacker and it can take some hits in a pinch. Its first glimpse of defensive utility was in generation 7, where its resistance is to Ash Greninja Stab, as well as Heatran's Magma Storm and the ability to defog away both of their hazards gave it the unique place in OU. However, it still used an offensively minded set to achieve this. In generation 8's Crown Tundra, however, Spectre ran loose in OU and players scrambled to find answers. There were other dark types of course, but for the first time, Hydreigon proved it can be an outstanding defensive force. With investment, its special bulk was great, and it also let it take on other threats like Heatran and Hurricane Zapdos, while providing critical anti-hazard support and defog. But what was most useful about it was its access to instant recovery with Roost, as well as a lack of a Stealth Rock weakness, which made it much more reliable at withstanding Spectre A than the other dark types commonly used for the role, like Mandibuzz or Tyranitar, which of course was hit by Spikes. Special Offensive Hydreigon became an OU staple overnight for its ability to counter Spectre A. It disappeared once Spectre A was banned and went back to using its offensive sets instead, so it's definitely the most niche Pokemon on the list, but at one point, Hydreigon, one of the most all out offensive Pokemon of all time, went fully defensive to hold the OU metagame together against an obscenely broken threat. In Advanced OU or Gen 3, Salamence is one of the most prominent dangerous threats, as you can expect from most Dragon types and its offensive Pokemon through and through. It does of course have great defensive traits. In addition to its many resistances, it also possesses the coveted Intimidate ability, allowing it to help its team dance around many physical threats, from Tyranitar to Aerodactyl to even opposing Salamence. It's even got a unique place in the tier as one of the few true checks to the terrifying Heracross. However, as nice as these defensive traits are, Mence is usually a threat. Usually. What could Mence do that would make you want to use it defensively, you might ask? There's no Roost in Generation 3. Very true. But thanks to an event, Mence does have Wish. Salamence doesn't just have the means to heal itself, it becomes an even bigger pillar of support by healing its teammates, filling out the rest of its move pool with Protect, Toxic, and Flamethrower, and maxing out its physical bulk. Wish Mence becomes incredibly irritating to deal with, both in terms of switching into it and how much physical abuse it can withstand in conjunction with Intimidate. It laughs in the face of even Rock Slide as it poisons the attacker and then happily stalls it out. Wish Mence occupies a seemingly unique role in Gen 3 OU. Sure, it's usually an offensive terror, but when it fully utilizes those naturally solid defensive traits, it becomes one of the most frustratingly effective walls in the tier. This set quite the precedent, as even today we can see bulky Mence uses in Generation 8 UU, dealing 
dealing with powerful threats like Zarud, Scizor, huge power Diggersby, and even opposing Salamence while defogging away hazards and using its newly acquired Hurricane to dish off powerful attacks. Here is the most extreme example of the premise of offensive threats not being wasted with bulky sets. Mewtwo is the most terrifying offensive Pokemon ever. Surely you wouldn't quote unquote waste it by not giving offensive investment in moves, and yet it is precisely Mewtwo's combination of bulk, speed, and move pull, including recover, that gives birth to perhaps its most frightening guise of all, in which it goes from the ultimate killing machine to absolutely unkillable. Usually, Mewtwo's one weak point with offensive sets is that it's not much in the way of longevity. Life Orb eats into its own health, it doesn't heal off passive damage, and any offensive attacks from Scarfers hit it hard. With leftovers, bulk investment that doesn't go beyond max HP, will o for physical attackers, and light screen or amnesia for special attackers, and even taunt to prevent tactics like toxic, or potentially mixing things like substitute in there to maximize Mewtwo's capacity for pressure stalling, all in conjunction with its absolutely incredible speed, Mewtwo is downright impossible to stop for nearly the entire DVP Uber's tier, and all without a single direct offensive attack. Well, it can use Ice Beam, Aura Sphere, or Earthquake to maximize the number of Pokemon it beats, the latter two moves most notably turning the tables on would-be checks like Heatran, but it doesn't have to, and it still comes with no attack investment at all. The best offense is often interlinked with great defense, even with something as offensively menacing as Mewtwo. And you know who said that? Ash Ketchum. But I think it was more like, the best offense is a good defense, and then he looked like a Corphish, so don't really follow his example. But, I mean, he's right, but yeah. <laughs> don't use Corphish. And higher tiers. So anyway, thank you for watching. One of the most important things when trying to innovate in this game is to look beyond preconceived notions of what a Pokemon can be. We've never had some, I just talk crap about Ash and I'm saying this, but we never had some of the most important defensive Pokemon around if we thought Lanner's Therian's high attack stat meant it could only be offensive. Thank you once again for watching. I hope you guys all enjoyed. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. If you all subscribe today, I can hit 300k and I'll see you guys with another video later tomorrow.